In Matthew chapter 2, I'll start with verse 1 and read through verse 6. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because that is what it was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. Thank you, Kim. It's a whole new year to begin with, and what a great thing to be able to do to worship God. Looking forward to the crazy family fusion. I don't know if what's all is going to take place on that, but uh, make sure you get registered for that. Let me introduce some things that we're going to be doing. No, I didn't forget about Christmas, and we're not going back to it. So just because we're doing wise men today doesn't mean it's about Christmas. So you're not getting more presents, okay? <laughs> but uh, this seems to fit well. We've been working on a different mission for the church and what that's all about and how that all fits together. And so I'm adopting that also as our theme for the year. And what we have come up with is seek Jesus, find Jesus, and share Jesus. I think there's a lot of ways in which we're able to seek Jesus, and maybe we don't always look for him in the best way. And there may be more ways in which we need to do some looking for Jesus and how he fits into our life. And the Jesus that we find, we may need to be aware more of who Jesus is. And certainly the sharing of Jesus and that reaching out to other people to let them know what we have. There's going to be more that is going to be told to you about the things that are coming up, as John indicated. Um, but this is what we have for now. This is the beginning. And so I'm excited about this. We're going to be talking about this, about seeking Jesus and trying to find him and and then trying to share that with the rest of the world. A lot of times we look for God on our terms. Uh, God reveals himself at different times in history in different ways, though. Uh, for example, if we'd lived before Christ, when we tried to find who Jesus was, well, he wouldn't have been here yet. There would have been a law of Moses, and we wouldn't have been able to try and figure out who Jesus was. God reveals himself in different times. If we're back in the time of Abraham, there is no Jesus. If we're in the time of Moses, there is no Jesus. Today, we can look at this and say, well, of course, we understand the will of God. We can see it all, but I want you to realize that it hasn't always been like that. You see, we intersect with God wherever we are, but God can intersect with us at any point. And we can only respond to God from that one time in history. And so I want to go back to this one time in history in Matthew chapter 2 where it talks about a time when wise men came to find a king. And that's what they were looking for. They come to find Jesus. But the Jesus they're going to find may not be like the Jesus we would be looking for today. Because after all, he's just been born. They say we saw his star. We know he's been born. They come asking questions. And so we saw his star as it rose. I don't know exactly how you see a star of a king or what that's all about, but that's exactly what they say happened. We saw his star and we've come to worship, and so they come and ask the current king, where's the new king? That's not always a good move because sometimes asking the current king, where's your successor, makes him a little bit nervous. And he decides, I'm not sure I want anyone to succeed me. And so that's the case with Herod. They don't have a stake in this. They're just looking for a baby. That's all there is. Herod gets worried about a king who's going to take over. If they'd said he's only a baby and by the time you get old, well, he will 
be completely gone. It's, it's you know, it, it, he isn't a threat to you. And yet Herod feels that. <clears throat> Herod doesn't know anything about the birth. And so basically what happens is he's got to call for his chief priests and prophets and look for where is this to be born? Is this even real? And certainly it is. And they decide that it's going to be in Bethlehem. There's even a prophecy out of Micah 5, 8 on it. And so they have this prophecy about the new king, the Messiah, who's to come being born in Bethlehem. And so he goes and he tells them about that. In verse 7, it says, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained to them the time the star appeared. And he sent to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceeding with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Herod wants to know the specific address. He does not have the best intentions. He says he'll go and worship, but I think he has other things in mind, mainly destroying the new king so that his kingdom is safe and secure. But he says, I want you to go and tell me. And so as they leave Herod, they go toward Bethlehem. But sure enough, that star appears and they're able to see the, exactly where it is that they're supposed to go. This is not a manger story. I hope you know that by this time already. Uh, this gets told around the time of Jesus' birth, but it's not around the time of Jesus' birth. This is many years later, at least a couple years later. Uh, Jesus is no longer a tiny baby. He is a toddler by this time. And when you look at the, the, even the text and the way that it's put here, they had started at the time when the baby was born. And by the time they get here, it's been quite a while. Where's the one who's already been born? So it isn't like a week ago. It isn't even a day ago. This may be a year ago. So it's not a manger scene. And they come, and they're trying to find this one who's been born king. Now, what are they expecting? Well, he's got to be pretty young. They've come from a long distance. He's not a manger scene because when they came to the place where it was, they entered the house where he was staying. He's had time to build a house. He already knows where the house is. And so they go into the house where he is staying now. And it's not as if it's something that is, you know, just out of the manger. And so this has been a little bit of time. And they're looking for this new king. But they know that the new king's just been born. They found exactly what they wanted. They found a new king who is just there, who has been in this place, who has all of this potential. But he isn't the king yet. He isn't sitting on the throne yet. He doesn't command armies yet. And so that's really not what they were looking for in the first place. They were looking for the one who is the promise, the one who is the one talked about by God, the one who is the Messiah for all of Israel. And they say, we get a chance to see him first when he's just brand new. And so they come and they're not disappointed at all when they come and they're able to find this. And so we know that this is probably around two years after Jesus has been born because Herod counts the time that they saw the star and begins to kill all babies two years old and under. And so Jesus may have been between six months and two years at this time. So people come to seek Jesus and they find a baby in a house and they worship and they give gifts. Let me just ask, have you ever been disappointed by what you find from God? 
You thought it was going to be one thing, and it turns out it's not quite like what you thought. I think we have that a lot in advertising and things. You ever seen the advertisements for a hamburger? It looks so good. There's the advertisement. What you get has been stuffed into a little tiny tin foil thing, and it's not even hot anymore. I don't know why it looks that way, but that's what they sell, and then that's what you get. It's a wonder we don't take it back every single time and say, this doesn't look like the picture. Do you ever think people do that with God? Look at what God was giving. Look at what God promised. Look at all these things. And then you get there and it's like, oh, it's a baby. Huh. Not what we were thinking. The wise men didn't have that issue. Let me share another passage with you that's a prophecy of Jesus. This is from Isaiah chapter 9. And I know the print might be a little small, so you might want to look it up in your Bible. This is talking specifically about who Jesus was to be. And it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. And they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the staff for his shoulders, the rod of his oppressors, you have broken as the day of Midian. Every boot for the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And on the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice, with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is spoken a thousand years before Jesus is born. This is what they were looking for. This is what they wanted to find. And so when they go and they look and they find a child, do you think they're disappointed? Doesn't look like everlasting father, does it? Doesn't look like almighty God. It looks like a toddler. It looks like a child. It, uh, God, I, I think some, something messed up in the communication here. We were supposed to get this great, wonderful Messiah, the one that you had promised, and it's so amazing and great and powerful. It's never going to end. Governments are going to change. All governments are going to change because of him. You realize he's going to sit on the throne of David. David was the one who was above all things. He's the greatest warrior of all time. You realize David never lost? Never. He's the greatest warrior that there ever is. Not only Goliath, but all other armies. And we have a king like that. And you show me a child? God, I think there's been a bait and switch. Somehow this is worse than the hamburger. Do you think people come to God and they're looking at what God think, says and what this looked like and they're going, this doesn't look like it. This doesn't look like the same thing at all. That's a lot of promise that you're giving there. Justice and righteousness is just so much. And what we get is a baby. Maybe a little bit of disappointment because he's not very impressive in human form. But grace and mercy isn't really visible, is it? At least not on a physical level. And I think it's why they miss their own Messiah. Because we think God should be completely, fully grown altogether. And when we intersect God, he's not. His plan has not been fully developed. His plan has not been fully carried out. If we had come during the time of David, 
we would have been under law of Moses. There would be no Christ. It would just be promise. If it was during this time of Isaiah, we would have been able to read it, but there's no Jesus yet. And when you look at it today, and you come, and there's this Jesus, and you look at the promise of Isaiah, and you look at, do we see that in our world today? Is he the one ruling governments? Is he the one who's in charge of all of this? So let me just ask you, are people looking for God today? Are they disappointed? Because the Bible talks pretty big. It's huge. Let me ask you, when they read about a church that's one heart and one soul, are they disappointed? They read about the spiritual communion with God and the Holy Spirit filling every single person there. And they read about this people that is all unified together. Will they be disappointed when they see it? I hope not. You see, it is not a bait and switch. Now, your hamburger is. Sorry, it's just not going to get any better. But what happens is we come looking for this great Messiah, and he's just been born. And so the plan is not fully developed yet. Or we come looking for this Jesus, and we see a great miracle worker. But there is no, still no redemption because he has not died. Or we come looking for Jesus in the turn of the century and in the early church, and we see, yes, there's this powerful Jesus who's there. And there are people who are living like him and who are wanting to live like him. But he's not complete yet, at least in their life. And so we see churches that have all kinds of issues and problems and things that are going on in them and, and things where people can make accusations and say, well, that doesn't look like God. That doesn't look like this great picture that we have. And they might look at us that way too. Because what happens is we haven't really finished yet, have we? Have you done everything you know God wants? Is your life complete, your faith mature, and everything perfectly the way it's supposed to be? I don't know that there's anything in my life. There's still a bunch of things that I have to do at home. You have honeydew lists. That garage has got to be done. The lawn's got to be mowed. There's all these things that are supposed to be done and aren't really done. So if we come to your house and we go, what happened? We thought you had this great place. And he said, well, it is. I just got to clean it up a little bit. We're invited to this great dinner. And we say, well, great. We're coming over and we're expecting this great dinner. And you go, well, yeah, it will be. I just forgot to go to the store. So I've got to go run out and buy some stuff real quick. And it'll just be about four hours for me to cook it. You see, we get caught in our lack of preparation and I think sometimes that's what happens is we see God and we expect all of these things from God and God was expecting us to be those things for other people. To have that already fulfilled. To have that completely done for us to be that fulfillment of the prophecy that he gives. And we're working on it. We're getting there. But we're not that fast. And so what I want to say is, let's hurry up and do it this year. Maybe this is the year we need to finish some of those things and say, I want to be that spiritually mature person that God has always wanted. I want to have that person who is filled with the Holy Spirit of God and you can see the fruit of that Spirit coming out of my life. I want to be that person of prayer. I want to be the one that God is trying to show to the world and says this is what a powerful life looks like when we face trials and when we face struggles. And maybe we've looked at it and gone, well, that's not that impressive because it really hasn't been finished yet. And we haven't finished building the church that we should be. And people come looking for God and they find us. It's not a bad thing. Because it's right where they need to begin. Because their life needs to be put together. There will be a great church here. 
like Jesus wants. There is a great church here like Jesus wants, but I think we're incomplete. We have part, and more people are coming to join us, and more people are going to be there. But let's finish this. Let's make this be exactly what God wanted. As Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3, when he's trying to talk about the church that he had established in Ephesus, he says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all saints, his grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. He's trying to make the wisdom of God known through his church. We are that example. We are what he needs to be. Grace has been given to him to preach to the Gentiles. And we look at the church that we read about in, in Ephesus, and it looks like a great church, and yet he always talks about this more that they can be, this more that they can give. And it's the light of the mystery that he is saying is being revealed. It's through that church the wisdom of God is known. And people are being taught and leaders are being developed in order to lead. And today, people are looking for that complete person of God on earth. And the best we can show them is, this is how far we got. This is what we're doing. Come be part. Come work with us. Because it looks like this when his name is completely done. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And his church is an amazing place to be. And we are people filled with the Spirit. And we are people able to work with God. And we are people able to show grace. And we are still working on a few things. But we have his grace and his forgiveness and his power and his love in us. And that's what needs to be this year. That we finish that and that we share the Jesus that we know in our life and that we have been forgiven and so we share that forgiveness and that we have his spirit and so we share that spirit and that we are able to say there is so much great power in God's life. Come and be part. Maybe today you're struggling with this. I don't say we're perfect yet. We haven't gotten it all together yet. But one of the things I like about being here is these are people who work together well and we try together well and we read scripture and we study scripture and we are able to see what God does and God certainly is working among us. Do you want to be part of that? Me too. Let's stand and sing.